All right, welcome to Lights, Camera, Barstool. A uh, very quick turnaround episode after the last one, but there is a lot of news that uh, has come out between this episode and the last episode. Plus, I finally have had the chance to go and watch Anora. Uh, I went and saw it with Clemmer a couple days ago, and um, watching that movie next to Clemmer was like watching it with like your dad with like the sex scenes. <laughs> oh no! So like I'm sitting there next to Clemmer, who and he's he's about like what like like sixteen, seventeen years older than me, and like he's sitting there. And we're just watching these girls get railed. And yeah. it's just sitting next to Clemmer with that was not not ideal viewing experience. But however, it's still extremely good movie. And we'll we'll get to that. Uh, it's got uh, to be sitting next to uh to sit next to Shay coming out of the theater just saying it's one of the worst of the year. Yeah, that would be significantly worse. <laughs> I would uh, I would have fought him in the parking lot like that <laughs> guy outside of the Paris theater near the yeah, Ari Aster guy. Yeah. <laughs> I would have been throwing hands on Steven if I walked out of that theater and he was like worst movie of the year. <laughs> it's the worst movie I've ever seen. Uh, but before we get to that, let's talk about some of the news. Uh, first one being the we got the first teaser for Mission Impossible. Uh, the Final Reckoning is now the title. Um, I'll be honest, just right off the bat, I don't love the title. I don't love that title at all. The the title only works. Final Reckoning only works if it is the final movie, which I just do not. I cannot believe that this will be the final time Tom Cruise plays Ethan Hunt. Like, I'm just not believing that. I also like. I get it because you're doing it off the like the heels of Dead Reckoning, and Dead Reckoning yeah. I think is a cool title. The Final Reckoning feels like a like um like a Naked Gun title. You know what I yeah. mean? Like like was it the Final Insult or whatever like their titles were? Uh, that I don't totally get. And the other ones always have pretty cool titles like Ghost Protocol, like um fucking Rogue uh, Nation, Rogue Ghost. Nation. Oh, it's fucking cool. Like I don't know. I just don't love Final Reckoning, but that's whatever because the movie's probably gonna be great. Coming out in May of next year. It's got all the returning cast plus uh, the computer dude from the first movie that got sent to Alaska, whose name, yep. by the way, he has one of the coolest names, most masculine names I think I've ever seen in my entire life. His name is Rolf Saxon. Rolf Saxon. Would you ever picture that's his name based on looking? At, I would picture his name as like Dave a, Jennings. He, that that man fought a lot, fought alongside like. What is his name? Robert the Bruce. <laughs> like Ragnar Lothbrok in the fucking Viking age. Like that's that's just not the name that guy should have at all. Uh, his name should be like, you know, like Dan Smith, BYU. Like that's, I don't know. But uh, the Holt McCallany is joining as well. Nick Offerman, had a Waddingham, uh, a couple others, uh, including a lot of people from the returning from the last movie from Dead Reckoning. Um, the trailer, I love what they've done with these last two trailers where it's like, Let's give you minimal, minimal dialogue. Let's just give you a, a quick, like, little pastiche of everything we're going to do in this movie. And we're going to put really good music, like, foreboding, like, that Lauren Boff score over it. And that's it. Yeah. And they did that, I believe, the last teaser for um, Dead Reckoning as well. I loved it both times. Uh, I really, really, really like that. Uh, we didn't, they didn't show too much. They give you, like, little teases of the stunts. That's it. Love it. Yeah, I do also. They kind of pulled back on the, the big major stunt this time. Like, last, for Dead Reckoning, they... I mean, the stunt was awesome. Even when I saw it in theaters, the uh, the motorcycle jump. But they really hammered that that yeah. home through the teasers and trailers, like over and over and over again. Um, they didn't do that here. A lot of Tom Cruise running in this trailer, which is really what'll sell some tickets. People were going nuts mm -hmm. for that. He looks so good when he runs. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and um, I think that's some of the other things, like you were saying with the motorcycle stunt, it definitely. I don't want to say took the air out of it a little bit, but like you've seen it so many times already yep. that like, I don't know, I guess it did kind of take the air out. So yeah, not showing as much of it, I think it was smarter. And um, I think also what will be smarter this time is presumably they will not put it out up against a behemoth slate, which I think was disastrous for Dead Reckoning going up against Bob, uh, Barbenheimer and just losing. No, you, you wait. We still have we still have time. Time for Paramount to move the Mission Impossible. They're going to you know what they're going to do? They're going to put it on that like same two week schedule uh, that Superman and Fan Fantastic Four is releasing. Yeah. Next year. Like, that's some shit they would do. Just play it smart. Just play it smart. You Dude, just put find, it. <laughs> find a good runway for the I'm for IMAX. That's it. They make it so complicated. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. just like put it out whenever. People, people are not, you know, adhering to, you know, standard scheduling anymore. I don't, I don't yeah. think that that's as much of a factor as it should be. It reminds um, me of, um, was it Trump when he um, joined the or like the board of like the AFL and he was like they initially the AFL like they would play in the spring when the NFL was off and like the ratings were good they were getting good players a lot of shit and then like Trump like convinced everyone like no we have to compete alongside the NFL so we could beat them and then they immediately folded like yeah they, 
they lost like that next season. It's kind of like that with the Mission Impossible, the last one anyway. It's like you could have, you could have theoretically been in the perfect space if you just did a before, a couple months before, a couple months after. Ugh. They released a week before Bar- Barbenheimer. Still yeah. just batshit insane. Like everyone knew that was going to be a massive hit. And <laughs> all anyone was talking about. It's fucking crazy. Um, so in the other bit of Mission Impossible news is that uh, Tom Cruise reportedly wants Glenn Powell to take over for him. Glenn Powell said, there's no way my mom would let me uh, because his mom had seen the um, the stunts that they do in the movies. And he's and she's like, I don't want you doing any of that. And to be fair, I don't think many people want to do that. I don't think a lot of people want to take over that same level of commitment to insane and dangerous stunts that Tom Cruise has. No, you'd have to be an absolute psychopath. But Glenn Powell, if he wants to take that next step, he's in the he's in the school of Cruise now. There's no getting Mm -hmm. out like you have to if you're going to do it, commit. I do think if he wants to be that next level action star, someone, if it's not him, is going to have to pick up that mantle of like just being an absolute lunatic. Like, yeah, like like it it really does make a difference no matter how far CGI can take us. Any of the the volume effects, like being able to do real stunts always plays. Mm hmm. And, uh, uh, but I, I do not believe that. I, I think Tom Cruise might have said that to someone, but I, I don't think Glenn Powell is ever going to be a part of this franchise. Um, I wouldn't mind him as a. I, I would never want him to take the torch of Ethan Hunt, if that makes sense. Like I wouldn't yes. mind him being in the franchise at all. But would I want him to be the new Ethan Hunt? No, probably not. I don't think that. That's. I, I read someone posted a theory that Cruise maybe is battling with paramount in the past few years and they are possibly trying to once ethan or once tom cruise hangs up his cleats uh turn mission impossible into a television series which Again? tom cruise is like fuck no <laughs> like you yeah. will absolutely not do that to my baby uh and so he's kind of playing a little bit of chicken with them saying you know what i'll just have my boy glenn come in and take over <laughs> But it's slightly different, but they did do that with Jack Reacher and it was a massive success with a different character. Oh, granted, yeah. that was a I mean, it's not going to sound that crazy different, but it is that Mission Impossible is obviously significantly more successful in every possible facet than Jack Reacher movies were um, it's so dependent on like the Mission Impossible is so dependent on being able to do like massive, like million upon million dollar stunts. Like, yeah, <laughs> I just don't think it works on TV. Yeah, I agree. Uh, a Game of Thrones movie is officially in the works. Uh, great, good. Um, it's like I, I don't know how many of these we've talked about this before with movies that have come out about uh, like like successor movies to series before, and how there is a pretty limited um, like number of successful examples. Like I like, think many Saints of Newark wasn't great. Uh, no. Entourage movie wasn't great. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, hey! The Entourage movie was great. And Entourage <laughs> movie was Dude. not great. Dude, like Gronk, is- dude, Gronk, Gronk was in it. Ronda Rousey, come on. Probably the um, best one I get think of off the top of my head was the Deadwood one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but even that, like, it wasn't like that was a massively successful movie. No. So, like, I don't know. Um, I, uh, Game of Thrones obviously is like way more of a behemoth than any of these shows combined put together in times like a multiple of twenty. So, like, there is a way bigger fan base, but some I think people are craving something good at the same level of the early game of thrones season but what part of what makes those so successful to me is the fact that you have all this time to draw out this political entry and doing that over like a two and a half hour runtime i don't know how that works unless that's just not what you're going for here you're going more for like a a very condensed storyline one big battle and you're done and if that's the case sure uh but yeah i don't know yeah, I, I with you. I don't really understand how Game of Thrones works on the big screen unless you're going to commit to a massive saga like Lord of the Rings. Like they're big books. I mean, they're they're big ass books with long ass storylines, a lot of moving parts that don't really fit into a two hour runtime. Um, also, people are just programmed to want to watch Game of Thrones on HBO on Sundays. Like, mm-hmm. are they going to flock to the theaters to see it on a big screen? Or are they just going to wait for it to hit the max app when David Zaslav inevitably pulls it out of theaters three weeks into its run? Uh, yeah. We'll throw it on and get some more subscribers. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't think this is the best idea, but at least they're doing something. And this one, this sounds very concrete compared to like all the other shit that's just been thrown at the wall. Um, yeah. We also got the, the first look at. Dunking the egg. Um, did, I don't yeah. know if you well, saw that. Second look, I guess, because they showed for a while back. Yeah. The, uh, just a quick, but it was like three tiny things. Yeah. Yeah. 
But I, I want more Thrones on TV. Thrones feels yeah. it, it belongs there. Like it needs, like you said, a lot of time to just kind of get through all the political intrigue, get through all the storylines. I don't necessarily think it works in a in a movie format. What if, and I'm trying to think about it in my brain, you give HBO money to, or I guess Warner Brothers money to like Peter Jackson to do a Game of Thrones trilogy. And I'm not talking like I'm not saying you, you give them the money and the time and the resources and the on location and the practical to do a Game of Thrones movie. I'd be suckling at the teat for that. That would be fantastic. Honestly, you know what that should have been? It should have been the, it should have been House of the Dragon. That, yeah, honestly. That's the right amount of storyline for for three movies or two movies um, yeah. that's being stretched into something too long um, like that or like Aegon, what, Aegon's Conquest. I know that's been a yeah, storyline yeah. that people really want. Like that, I think that could work in a movie. Maybe I'm not really familiar with that story, but something more specific to a single character or a couple of characters. Um, Who else could be a good director of a Game of Thrones movie? Which I think, like, who's good at fantasy, like high fantasy? David Lowry. Yeah, but like the scale of it is so different. You know what I mean? True. Like, Uh, I mean, (laughs) Ridley Scott. (laughs) Yeah, but like he would never do it. <laughs> but that's the a, asking him to CGI in on like a dragon and shit. Uh, although I guess in his early work he kind of did some shit like that. Yeah. Um the what about the dude that uh he's directed like all the best battles in Game of Thrones. Uh I forget his name like David or he's got did like Battle of the Bastards. He did um the big battle at not, uh, Rook's Rest in this one, right? It's not like um, Sapnick or whatever that guy's name was. Was it? Uh, it might be Michael Sap no, Alan Taylor. Alan Taylor. Okay. Okay. So yeah, he directed that, and I think he directed like a bunch of the other like best battle sequences. Maybe him, but at the same time, I think a bigger name would be cool. And if you gave like Peter Jackson the time and the money, send his ass down to New Zealand with a fucking crew of these people and make a Game of Thrones movie, man, that would like the Weta team, like that could be fucking awesome. That could. I mean, we got is Peter Jackson just dead? Is he or is he just stuck doing doc- documentaries? That's, yeah, I mean, he's very good at it, but. I would love to see him try to make movies again. I think that he is jaded from his post Lord of the Rings experience because the Hobbit trilogy, he kind of got fucked over on. Wasn't great. Uh, the like King what, like, Kong what, wasn't bad. King Kong was. Yeah, that's like solid. But then like even after that, like he like the documentaries are getting the highest praise. Like they are. Yeah, he made those two. The the World War One, uh, they shall not grow old one. And then the Beatles one, both like insanely highly regarded. And like, that's a great niche. And the lift there is so minimal as far as like uh like budget budgetary um yeah. deadlines like shit like that. So I feel like that's much easier for him. And he's made like a trillion dollars off this Lord of the Rings stuff. So I don't know. I know he has a massive in his, in his like uh, whatever his uh, uh land on uh in on New Zealand or in New Zealand he has like a massive lot and warehouse full of World War One relics that he just sh- keeps shipping them into uh. New Zealand to keep and hold on to like he has like howitzers and like tanks and shit and uh do you I don't know if you remember when we interviewed what's his name Ty West from uh for yeah. X or for Pearl he said that they borrowed half the shit they used from Peter Jackson for the World oh, War II, I don't remember that at all shit. yeah it's fucking very funny uh, <laughs> that's crazy yeah. very crazy but I respect him he's becoming like an like an old dad that just wants to collect weird shit for his hobby and he except he just has multiple more millions of dollars than most of these other people uh so yeah that's game of thrones uh barbara broccoli says that they are looking fucking stupid goddamn name change your name lady uh uh they're looking for an actor in the 30s for bond possibly a person of color uh this is i think important because it eliminates a lot of actors people have floated uh who are like in their 40s uh, mid 40s like even like um for example like Idris elba people have floated for a long time that's now eliminated uh there i don't know who it would be in my brain just to see the british people get pissed off i would love if it was like an american black guy just because (laughs) they would get so fucking mad and michael b jordan yeah like throw michael b jordan in as bond and oh my god the hatred would come out of those fucking red faced people like nothing else it'd be so funny um we've talked about it a lot i think with bond i think we're kind of both on the aaron taylor johnson train right Yes, I, I'm very much. I would like to see someone more physical and bigger. And Aaron Taylor Johnson, I think, really sold me in Bullet Train. <laughs> he was, 
that's just what I, I kind of really want to see that that iteration of Bond. Mm-hmm. He's only thirty four. Like you could play that character for a long time. He's got like that. We, we've talked again. You mentioned like Bullet Train. He was so smooth, so like smooth, sexy, hot, fucking physical. Uh, he's done great in some in, like really dramatic roles, and he's done great in some very just pure action roles. So that kind of fits the bill for everything you want out of Bond. Yeah, uh, the the pool of people to choose from is surprisingly thin. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's always felt like there's so many actors that could play Bond, but once you narrow it down to actors in their 30s, there's not a lot of guys like that out there right now. At least, it'd be like, you said off the top of my head, like, there's like Theo James, Dev Patel, like, great choices. Uh, Kalua has been thrown out there. I don't think he would do it, but I don't think he'd be a particularly great fit. Yeah. Like in the same way that I don't necessarily think that um he's almost too sleek. Yeah. In the same way that it, well, who's the first name sorry that you mentioned? Theo James. Like I'm not even sure if Theo James would be necessarily a great fit because he's not he's too too hot. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like almost not in a Pierce Brosnan anyway. I don't think he tech necessarily works either. And Pierce Brosnan was handsome. Handsome. Still is, yeah. but I think that's a very clear delineation for the James Bond character is that they're not hot. Yeah. They're always handsome. Yeah. Like, it's, like classically handsome. Yes. Um, maybe like uh, Taron Egerton might work for that. Dude, we got to talk about Taron Egerton, by the way. I, I do like that pick, but his agent. I, yeah. think him and Tom, I think him and Tom Holland swapped agents. Yeah. Dude, his agent has him in two straight Netflix movies. Straight to Netflix yeah. movies. What's this this TSA one that they had the trailer for? Uh, it's like I Patrick don't even Bateman. know. It's and uh, but Daniel, however, uh, to to just to for Devils or uh, what do you call it? Um, to play uh, Devil's Advocate, the BlackBerry series was unbelievably it was. good, and he was but that was like and five he, years. It was like five years ago now. <laughs> was it really? Yeah. No, that can't be. That can't be true. It came out in like two thousand nineteen. Yeah. No fucking way. That came, oh, and there, there was another thing he was in recently that was good too that I'm blanking on. Uh, oh, he, the Tetris movie I liked a lot too. That wasn't like a doorbuster or anything, but that okay, was. I was wrong. Blackbird came out in 2022, <laughs> two yeah. years ago. I thought it was way longer. Yeah, it feels the, like uh, forever. The, he's he's such a charismatic, young, like multi talented, triple threat actor that it's it's very head scratching that he hasn't broken through even after having like major roles. <laughs> like he's a well known actor. Too. Like Sing yeah. was amazing. Like yeah, all his other movies were pretty good, and he's a good singer. He's like Rocket Man was amazing. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I think he'd be a good fit. He's maybe, and obviously he has the experience kind of with the Kingsman, which is a ripoff of Bond, but like the or yeah. playoff Bond anyway. The maybe he's too small. He's a tiny guy. Craig is pretty small though, too. That's true. Hmm. Yeah, I guess maybe it wouldn't matter, but maybe he might be too similar to Craig. That's also maybe one that, of that. That I think would probably be the biggest issue. Yeah. Um, but yeah, shout out to the broccoli people. Uh, Lupita Nyong'o, Anne Hathaway, and Zendaya have joined Tom Holland and Matt Damon and Christopher Nolan's new unnamed movie. I feel like all the information that has been floated about the actual movie, like what it would be about, when it would be set, has been like refuted or denied or new information has come out and that has said something different. Um, the one thing that has been kind of generally agreed upon that I've seen is just that like it is not going to be set in the present day. That is the only thing that I've seen that most people agree on. Um, I th- think that this crew is insanely talented we talked about it with tom holland before he needs a win and christopher nolan is like the ultimate unicorn in movie history that just is this like you were saying like a triple threat type of guy before nolan is the triple threat yeah. critics audience and money like he gets all of them all the time uh great for them and this crew i mean lupita is like one of the like i would say the top five actors working right now um and hathaway is she's Anne hathaway i guess uh and zendaya is like top of the world so what this crew is fantastic yeah, no, Anne Hathaway, frequent Nolan collaborator now. This is her yeah. her third. And to be honest, her filmography kind of, it's not great outside of the Nolan stuff. <laughs> true. Um, Very true. Iconic as she is, but. She picks bad projects. You want to talk about a bad, bad agent like the bad. witches? What the fuck was that, bro? Uh, poor Anne. Um, but great additions. Like you said, Lupita's like, and they kind of held off on confirming that one for a while. And I was like, ugh. Like Zendaya and Anne are iconic and I love them, but in terms of like acting, acting, Lupita is top of the game. Um, oh, yeah. Very happy to have her. She's the mother bot, by the way, which I, she's I the what? she was the, uh, uh, the wild robot. 
Oh, she was okay. The voice that, of the that counts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but great additions. Um, we'll see how fleshed out these, these female characters are when it comes to pass. But, um, I mean, I'm pumped for this. I wish people would stop reporting on what the movie's about because I don't think we'll know until there's like something in the New York Times or, yeah. It'll be, it'll be a very official announcement whenever we do find out. So some of these other movies, the idea of you where she's banging the young man, uh, that is, yeah. that there, that has been a weirdly revived movie genre of attractive older lady just fucks the shit out of like a 19 year old boy. That has been, there's been like 18 of those movies. I feel like in the last year and a half or something between her and Nicole Kidman, Nicole Kidman's done like 20th. I don't know what she's, I wonder where Keith Urban is feeling it's about like, it's that a, it's right a lot of it's a lot of stay-at-home moms just streaming shit streaming dog shit on netflix all day yeah. and you know netflix figured it out they're like we're, we're, we're gonna make something for them yeah let's make them let's make 20 movies about a cougar fucking a young man um <laughs> she did um she came to me what was, what was the one where was it eileen was the one where she's like the lesbian with uh yes Thomas mckenzie um armageddon time armageddon time was a good movie i don't think that she was like actually never me, saw that it was pretty good uh lockdown that was one of the worst movies I saw. And that was uh, in recent memory. That was the one with her and she would tell edgy four where they, it was all over COVID mm -hmm. terrible. The witches terrible. The last thing that he wanted so bad that was with her and Ben Affleck, terrible movie. Dark waters was like solid, but I don't think she wasn't really the driving force no. of that. The hustle terrible. Oh, bad, Dude, bad. <laughs> just wait for the one that comes before that serenity. Dad boat. Dad. <laughs> I, I'm getting to the point where I think everyone involved with Dad Boat is like they're innocent. Like they're just innocent. Like no <laughs> one was like. There's too many talented people involved for. I don't know whatever the fuck that was. <laughs> yeah. Dude, Ocean's Eight was like. I think she was probably the, one of the better parts of Ocean Eight because she was kind of just playing like a rendition of herself in a way. But like that movie wasn't great. Uh, mm -hmm. Colossal was an interesting movie. Not one I would say that like was great. Great either. It was just kind of interesting. Uh yeah, Alice through Looking Glass, the intern. Actually, like the intern, but that's not her thing either. I don't think. But yeah, just not a great stretch for Anne Hathaway. No. Uh, also, do you Zendaya. think? Do you think uh, Zendaya and Tom? Do you think there'll be a couple in the movie? They have to be, right? I don't know because I don't know how that works on set. Because like, wouldn't you want more agency about how your relationship is portrayed? If you're playing a couple as well, that because uh, like, you know what I mean? You wouldn't want people to just come away because people are stupid. People are dumb. They'll walk away like watching their relationship in that movie and they'll be like, oh, this must be what they're like in real life. They must like hate each other, have problems with each other or like each other too much or do, uh, though True. people are stupid. So I wouldn't necessarily want that. But I also wouldn't want to be in a movie where she's, you know, fucking some other dude. And, yeah, like, it'd be very weird Damon. if she. Yeah, it'd be very weird if she's like with Matt Damon in the movie. <laughs> yeah. And Tom like is just off to the side. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It would be that hard. Enough. It's just hard to dissociate at this point. <laughs> Tom Holland in the cuck chair. That would be <laughs> in the hotel room. That's the whole movie where the whole thing takes place right there. Um, Matt Damon yeah, has yeah. a shaved head and multiple piercings. And <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right. Is Fiona. Tom, Tommy doesn't know. Yeah, it all it's all coming together. Uh, Denzel said he's retiring after his next batch of movies, which include a movie about Hannibal and Black Panther three. Black Panther three was news that no one was really aware of that he just said that uh he talked to kugler and kugler wrote, wrote him apart basically um that's huge the hannibal yep. movie i think is very interesting because that's not one that they've made it's a very interesting story hannibal and carthage in general and their wars mm -hmm. with rome um very cool story him like bringing elephants all the way across the fucking mediterranean to crossing the alps and attacking rome it's a very cool story uh that's cool um i don't I'm kind of sick of actors saying that they're retiring and then just unretiring like a year. I'm kind of sick of it. And I don't feel like Denzel will retire. Someone will come out with something that he he's like, oh, my God, it's like a dream thing for me. And he'll do it. So I don't necessarily believe that anymore. Yeah, I don't. I never imagined Denzel would be a guy to retire, to be honest. He just seems like he loves he loves the work so much. And I don't see him pivoting into any kind of behind the camera work. I don't think he's ever had his hands in that stuff. So is he going to step away from the industry entirely? Probably not. Does he have a production company? I don't know. It's a good question. He might be teamed up with Anton Fuqua, actually. No, they I do do like it. everything together. They do do. Um, they but yeah, do I, I, I never imagined him to be a guy to retire. Um, 
<laughs> the Black Panther three thing. He'll, he'll have one scene in that movie if that if that. The way right. he brought it well, up, he directed like, fences. Yeah. I didn't know that. I feel like he I directed thought, fences. I didn't know that at all. And fences oh. was very good. But that yeah. was also like that was also the the you're almost adapt. He he was adapting it from the play, and the play was very um, well regarded. And it is shot a lot like a play, but I don't, I don't know. But it was very, very good. He also directed Antoine Fisher and okay. The Great Debaters and an episode of Grey's Not Anatomy bad. and Journal for Jordan. Uh, but yeah, I didn't know. Wow, I didn't so know I was, he did I was very wrong. <laughs> I knew he had directed something, some episodes of something. And I guess that was The Grey's Anatomy. I just remember that from having to rewatch that wretched series multiple times, but I did not know that he directed fences. I completely plant like either didn't know that or blacked that out. Cause that is a, that's a very good movie. Okay. Well, if he does retire, I would love to see him hop behind the camera. Yeah. It's, I would love to see him direct some more stuff. Uh, Warner brothers is selling fully functional quote unquote Batmobiles. Uh, you can't say fully functional when those things have like machine guns and rockets and cannons and they turn into motorcycles and have all this other shit. That's not fully functional. I don't think. I think that's just a car that looks like the Batmobile. It's a big-ass car, though. The big-ass wheels. I bet it goes fast, too. Like, the thing here is $3 million feels low, even without the add-ons. Yeah. Um, and on the secondly, like ass. secondly, if you have $3 million to throw around on, like, a toy like this, then you have the money to add in, <laughs> add on yeah. to it, and put the... Put the cannons, put the put the blasters, put anything you want on there. Yeah. Um, so I give it like six months until we see one of these things in Miami. Like the thing is, someone out of these ten that are being sold, one of the people that is buying one definitely is going to think that he's Batman. Yeah, like he's one hundred percent rich enough and thinks he uh, can like do it. Like he's like got his mind set. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm very excited to see which city this guy pops up in, thinking that he's a vigilante. I can kind of see in my head it being Mr. Beast. I could see Mr. Beast buying one of these fucking going to like whatever state has the most lax gun laws and getting it decked out with some crazy shit. And then like just doing like, like, you know, you can imagine the YouTube thumbnail week as Batman in Miami and like him, like just driving around the street, trying to find, you know, the most low stake criminals he could possibly find and not actually doing anything. Um, I want to see that. Uh, what's that streamer's name? Speed. <laughs> I want to see that I kid. <laughs> that kid with with that car would be an yeah. issue. <laughs> Him racing the car. Yeah, it, I don't know. That would be. I don't know. It's just not fully functional. Was more the idea here. Uh, and then also, lastly, Warner, Bro- Warner Brothers. <laughs> things are dire. Yeah. What the fuck? Like, are exactly. they that strapped? Did you see that one tweet I retweeted that was like Warner Brothers to sell copper wiring from their yeah, studio yeah, yeah. lot. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, bro, it's they're getting to that movies. point. They're canceling movies left and right. They're can- they're like canceling fucking putting studios to bed, like sunsetting shit. Like what the fuck? How are you this out of money? Plus you're merged with Discovery now. Like you should be. If anything, have a more of a, a, a wealth of cash. I don't know. <laughs> it makes no fucking sense, man. Um. Anyway, the last bit of news: uh, Mark Rylance is apparently the first choice for Dumbledore in the upcoming. Speaking of Warner Brothers, uh, Harry Potter series. Um. Yeah, I mean that's a good fit. Uh, Rylance is quaint old British guy. He's maybe not as, at least in the movies that I've seen him in. Uh, like the, I think of the character as Dumb- of Dumbledore as a generally jolly old fellow, and I never don't think I've seen that with Rylance. He's more of like a mysterious, creepy old fellow, and I don't get a lot of like warmth or joy out of his face or acting. So mm-hmm. I don't, uh, I don't know if maybe that necessarily is a fit. But like as far as older British actors go, it's not many better. Yeah, no, I think the biggest thing with the, and I don't think the wizarding, like the, the original Harry Potter series really gets enough credit for how well they casted. I mean, there's really like one miss in the whole cast and it's like, they casted her when she was eight years old. So and Ginny, but like just didn't work out, you know, didn't grow up the way you expect and didn't develop the way you expect. But the rest of the cast is unbelievable. And I think a big yeah. part of that is they got like classically trained stage actors. And that's what Rylance is. Like so he's a good fit. I don't know if he's the best fit for Dumbledore, but I do like that they're like targeting like movie stars, really great actors. That's what you need to do. And 
I think this will work is a thing. I, I really do think this Harry Potter series will end up working. Let me let me run an idea by you for a Dumbledore. And let me tell you what you th- and then tell me what you think. So Mark Rylance is 64 years old, right? Mm-hmm. Playing gonna be playing Dumbledore. There's another actor. He is 63 years old. Goes by the name of Jared Harris. I've seen that the, thrown around. The son of Richard Harris, who played Dumbledore in the first few movies. Mm-hmm. He, if you want to talk about guys that can give you a jolly old fellow type of feel, I've seen Richard Harris do it. You ever watch fucking like Mr. Deeds? Maybe not yeah. old in that, but like he gives you, he can give you a jolly performance if he needs to. It's not always like a suicide madman type deal. And I think that would be kind of cool. A little full circle moment. It would be cool. Um, I did see that name get thrown around. Unfortunately, I looked into it. Jared Harris is very much not into the idea of, of, of taking ah. on his dad's role which sucks. Ah. Uh, but yeah, he's, he's pretty much come out and unequivocally said, I will not do it. <laughs> um, there are, I do think they should explore more than just Rylance, but there are a lot of good options out there. Um, we talked about like the, there's a lack of, you know, guys who can do bond, but I feel like there's quite a few people out there who can do Dumbledore. Yeah. Let's, let's see what other British actors are in their sixties. Let's see. Best living. Give me Colin Firth. Yeah, he uh, put some prosthetics on Firth. Put some prosthetics on. He's so young. He's got the right twinkle in his eye, though. That's the thing. There's a little twinkle in the eye that Dumbledore has. Be kind of funny if it was Patrick Stewart, but he's too. I think too old now. (laughs) Patrick Stewart's old. (laughs) Daniel Day Lewis comes out of Daniel Day Lewis comes out of retirement to play Dumbledore. (laughs) Yeah. Dude, Hugh Laurie would actually, I think, be pretty good. That's a good one. Yeah, he. You want to talk about jolly older guys? Hugh Laurie would actually be a great fit for um, for Dumbledore. He's got like that tall, gaunt features too. Been watching the franchise, Richard E. Grant. Richard E. Grant would also be very good, very funny. Yeah. Uh, um, who else is in there? Sean Bean's. He's actually of the age now, but that wouldn't work. Jeremy Irons too evil. <laughs> yeah, Jeremy Irons would not work. Martin Freeman's too young, but he would also, I think, have that. <clears throat> Actually, it's too timid. Mm-hmm. Ben Kingsley. Yeah, Actually, he's, he's I don't think old, Kingsley's too soft. I think I don't think he's soft enough. If that makes yeah. sense. It's not Mr. Bean, Roan Atkinson as don't that one. It actually, I do think is interesting. <laughs> I, I think Roan Atkinson. Idea. I think that's interesting. <laughs> Michael Sheen actually wouldn't be terrible either. No. David um, Thewlis. David Thewlis has already been in Harry Potter, and he's, I think, too young. You know who would be good? Uh, I can, why am I blanking on his name? If he played Sirius, why? Uh, Gary Oldman. Yeah, Gary Oldman. Yeah, that would be terrible. Wouldn't be bad. Yeah, it's, it's so one funny. Of those things it, where can't break In this back. list of older British actors, almost 90% of them have already been in Harry Potter. Yep. Uh, ooh, Ian McShane wouldn't be awful. No, but he, I don't think he's got the voice for it. Clive His voice is amazing, but it's like too, I don't know, too swashbuckling. What about, um? who's the guy that played the sorcerer in um, uh, Kieran Hines? I don't Kieran Hines that. might not be terrible. But he's, he's got that, he can, ha- he can have that jolly look to him. <laughs> Fucking Jason Statham. I don't know. Let's, Jason let's Statham, the Dumbledore. Yeah. Oh, hey. Matthew Good, the guy who played uh, Ozzy Mandius. He's definitely still too young, but that would be not terrible. Reese, yo, oh, Reese fans from fucking um, like he just Ooh. played uh, Otto Hightower. Yeah, damn. Reese fans would be awesome. That uh, I'm, I think I'm kind of sold on that. Uh, anyway, sorry, that was too long to spend on Dumbledore. Uh, now we can talk about Anora. Um, Nora movie that you have seen, you saw a while ago. It took forever just for me to get to it. Um, big time Oscar front runner on multiple categories. Uh, written and directed by Sean Baker, starring uh, Mikey Madison, Mark Edelstein, which I believe. Yeah, I think you nailed right. that right off the bat. I'm pretty sure that yeah, was exactly right. I looked it up first, and that's what they said. So if it's wrong, you can blame Google. Um, and Yuri Borisov, uh, Anora, a young sex worker from Brooklyn, meets and impulsively marries the son of an oligarch. Once the news reaches Russia, her fairy tale is threatened as his parents set out to New York to get the marriage annulled. Um, again, 
big front runner, a lot of hype going into this. Uh, Sean Baker is like batting a thousand, has not missed once in his filmography. Uh, most recently, obviously, Red Rocket, which was super highly regarded. We loved it. Um, uh, Florida Project, same thing. Very highly regarded. We loved it. It was amazing. Uh, Sean Baker has been really, really good at capturing like the underbelly of the of the of the country, basically, and like really making it feel authentic and real. And he casts a lot of people like from these worlds within the movie, which also works out great for the most part. Um, this is, I think, out of all the movies I've seen from him, like obviously the biggest undertaking because yeah. it's the most money he spent in it, the most budget he's put into it, the biggest sets, the biggest scale, the biggest everything. Uh, and then that from that angle, I was always almost thinking going into it, like, oh, well, I don't know if I want this from Baker because I feel like maybe it's too, like, I love what he does in the smaller in the smaller scale, uh, but very, 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 very happy with uh, what he came my way with in this movie. I think it was awesome. It is a movie that was expertly acted, uh, basically top to bottom. You're not, not going to find a weak performance, especially from like Mikey Madison obviously already has a bit of a filmography, but the rest of these guys like Yuri Borisov has only already been Russian movies for the most part. Um, these other guys are just like Armenian comedians that he picked up off the street more or less. Um, and like these random other Russian actors that he like, kind of sh- flew in to be like in bit roles. Uh, great. Perfectly acted from top to bottom. It feels to me when I watched this movie, like a, funnier un- and less intense uncut gems, which I'm sure is a comp that everyone has already thrown out there. But that's exactly what I felt going out through, you know, throughout the entire thing. It's just, hey, here's 24 hours of chasing manicness. Uh, like, we need to get this XYZ objective done by any means necessary. Like, I running through the underbelly of New York City. And I loved the movie a lot. I liked it. I thought it was, like you had mentioned uh, before we, I had seen it, it's super funny. Yeah, it's very funny. very And very, like, not very heavy punchlines, but like very just like quietly little things the w- and the way lines are delivered funny. Um, I enjoyed it. I thought the ending was very, very tight, very good. Um, and I just, I liked it a lot. There's, there's, there's tough note to say much more without spoilers, but I, I think it, it is easily one of the best, if not the best movie of the year. Yeah, no, I, I loved it. And it's the kind of best picture nominee, best picture winner, hopefully. Uh, but I think we've been missing, like it's very accessible to, I think, almost all audiences outside of Stephen Shea. Um, yeah, basically, yeah. Which was a, a concern going in. Like, Sean Baker, I love his movies, but I'm not recommending The Florida Project to really anyone outside of people who know what The Florida Project is. <laughs> um, people who are really into movies. This mm-hmm. is a movie that anyone can watch. It has, like, shades of the hangover to it. Like, it really does. Yeah. Like, it's it's a worst night ever, worst day ever type movie um, that never stops, never lets up. Um, there's a very clear moment where the movie takes a turn, um, but it never stops being funny or stops being engaging. Um, the performances are incredible. I think Mikey Madison is as much of a lock as Killian Murphy was last year, as much as of a lock, a lock as we'll see, you know, this decade, like no one's taking that from her. Um, Sean Baker, fantastic becoming a household name. Now, um, if you've, this is the first movie you've seen from him, which I'm sure will be for a lot of people. You'd like his other movies too. Red Rocket, especially. I think this is closer to Red Rocket than it is to the Florida project. And just, it's very funny. Um, And then yeah, your Yuri Borisov, which we'll talk about, I think more about his performance and his deliveries and kind of how he ties into the end. What a like out of left field person to find like that. That was such a great performance. I was I was blown away by it. I think in a just world, he gets a supporting actor nomination. Probably doesn't happen. You know, he's not well known, but he was incredible. Uh, I, I love this movie. If it wasn't for Dune 2, it'd be my number one of the year. But it's my number two of the year right now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Awesome movie. Uh, I think from here on, we'll talk about some spoilers. So if you haven't watched it yet, skip forward. Um, so I think that uh, the big highlights for me. Let's talk about the opening first. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The opening is awesome. Just it's 15 minutes of lap dances from Mikey Madison set to like <laughs> unbelievable set to like the most stripper music of all time. Like we're going to have the best party of our lives. Like shit like that. Uh, it uh, is. I think that uh, to his credit, there are very few, I think directors maybe, or other people that can like capture the down in CD vibe of a strip club. 
like Sean Baker does. And Sean Baker has done a lot of shit with like sex workers before. So like not mm-hmm. fucking shit sex work. Like he's done he's done movies involving sex yes, workers. His before. last three movies have all been. Yes. Yeah. So they, he's he, this is something he's like very like he understands and is comfortable in this world. Um I think that he captured the strip club beautifully just not even from a um i think uh like a writing or whatever point but like cinematically like it looks yes very very good it is amazing to look at and then like especially from that opening 15 minutes like going from her in the strip club to like passed out on the subway coming home at like 7 a.m or whatever and having to sleep all day like that is i think really well put together uh almost reminded me a bit of um the uh the shot we had talked about this recently with widows with Colin Farrell, like from where he works mm-hmm. to where he lives, is it going to the same thing? Like, yeah, in this world, I'm making this money. I'm like rich, or, or, or not rich, you know what I mean? Like, I'm like, we're having fun, we're drinking, we're partying, blah, blah. And then, like, going back to like a shithole and like whatever, like uh, Benson Hurst or where I don't even know where they were. Um, but yeah, they, uh, the, I, I really enjoy that first 15. Yeah, that, that, like you said, that, that journey from the strip club back to our house is like the moment where you, kind of come onto her side, uh, which he hasn't had many characters like that in any of his movies where you actually want to root for them, especially yeah. main character wise. Like you never wanted to root for any of his main characters. They're always deplorable human beings. This is just, you know, someone who is a dancer and, you know, is working class, which I think that opening sets up perfectly. So you're immediately on her side and whatever is going to follow. Mm-hmm. Um. And I think that the setup for this works really well too, because they set up uh, Vanya. It was Vanya, right? I keep on I keep fucking up his name. Um, Vanya, the yeah, the, the actual, um, yeah, the kid. Uh, he, I think they set him up really well in this movie to make you kind of trust him, right? Yes. Where like you, you, you're like, oh, this is just like a goofy kid that it's like he wants to go out and do his own thing, but at the same time, you're getting like the shades of like, oh, this is also like a fail son. This is like. Mm-hmm. A, a fucking like a succession kid like roman roy type character almost in a way where you're like this kid could also just be a shithead um and i think they set you up to want to root for um anora and vanya which is smart yes. and i think that the way that it all ties back to the end where it's like and this is something that i think sean baker does brilliantly and it's kind of similar to how the penguin recently ended it's like there's the fairy tale endings don't happen you know what i mean and i think that this movie does a good job of kind of like deconstructing that a little bit um and by setting you up with vanya and by making you at the same time like you you're rooting with anora and with vanya against the f- parents and against mm-hmm. toros and they kind of give you that middleman with um igor uh which is nice because then that helps when you flip later uh but i really enjoyed all those characters a ton i, I liked that setup for him and i liked when you get introduced to toros is so funny the <laughs> way you get introduced- was- he fucking and killed me, man. He was so funny. He's great. Um, but yeah, like you said, like it, it really does. The second half works because it really gets you to invest in their relationship. Like you really think that there's a chance that they're going to end up together, that they actually do love each other um, and that they're going to run off into the sunset and escape his parents and end up with, you know, enough money to get by for the rest of their lives because he's just rich. Um, so when the betrayal does happen in the second half, you kind of lose hope with her. Like you hang on to that hope for even a little bit too. Like while they're driving around looking for him, you're like, maybe he'll come back and everything will work out. Nope. Mm-hmm. Um, but Toros, every time he took a fucking phone call <laughs> when he was in the, in the, in the church, uh, doing the baptism with, with the, so baby, sorry. So sorry. the baby in one hand and he's like checking his no. phone. And he, <laughs> he looks at the phone and says, no, it's so oh. good. Killed me. Yeah, he was and really good. The, uh, was it Garrett? And then the was assault on the house. What was that? <laughs> yeah, the assault on the house was very, very funny, like top to bottom, because like it's never, it's never like too dark. You know what I mean? It's it's it yeah. stays relatively goofy, but at the same time, like oh, like they are kind of like kidnapping this woman to a degree. Like yeah, and, and you're uh, like holy shit, <laughs> but you're yeah. also just dying laughing at Igor's just stupid faces, like <laughs> he's just having he's just having the worst day. Like he like, why, does why not want to be tying a henchman. Her up? And he's like, you told me to stop her. And like them doing like this, like Russian goon, like uh, routine, I thought was very funny between the two of them. Uh, yes. And both those characters, I think that I think it was Ganik or Garrick, um, the the other Armenian guy is also super fucking funny. Like all their line deliveries of just being like pissed off that they have to be there, like sitting there with like the bag of like shit on his nose. He's like, you broke my yes. nose. Fuck. Like, I think all that was uh, that assault was very, very funny. That was a great, great call. Um, yes. 
Yeah. And then um, the whole uh the fun every time once once Anora starts going like off the rails, like angry, mm-hmm. it's so good. Like cause you're mixing her Russian with like just this Long Island, just disgusting accent that's just so funny to listen to. Like your mother's a Shaluka. Like <laughs> yeah. so good. It's a very over the top accent for sure. Um and by the way, a little more Brooklyn. I'm gonna throw it on there. Don't throw it out on us. Uh, but yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a it was a it was a harsh accent to listen to at some of those moments. Uh, I think that was really good. And I think the whole chase sequence, especially the nighttime when they're running around Coney Island, was very very reminiscent to me of Uncut Jam specifically, just because it's very very similar structurally. Um, but that whole sequence I thought was great. And then I think the the big thing, and this is where some of our coworkers have disagreed. I do think that the ending was about as like perfect as you can get for yeah. what this movie was representing, right? Because to me, um, again, this is a fail son of a Russian oligarch, like in that line delivery. Because the whole time you can't really get, you're not getting any information from Vanya throughout the entire like mm-hmm. second and third act because he's like just ripped, drunk, whatever. But like that scene on the tarmac when like she stops him, she's like, "We're gonna stop it." He's like, "We're gonna what? We're gonna go get this annulled?" And he goes yeah we're gonna get this old. what do you think and he's like but thanks for making my last week fun like the like that moment when she realizes she was like a play thing for like yeah. a, a rich person you know what i mean like this like rich dickhead i think was so perfectly heartbreaking and then adding that on to the actual ending where igor who's just generally trying to be like i think like a nice dude like gives her the yes. ring and like she like uh you know gets on top of him all that stuff and like the that sequence where like she tries to kiss him and he stops and like she kind of like puts this all together like the only thing i can offer is like a sexual currency is like that is and, and like breaking down and crying i think that was perfect i think that was a great great ending and i know people maybe people didn't agree i thought that was a fantastic ending yeah i'm on your side i thought that was one of the best endings in years i mean fantastic like thread the needle perfectly uh, just looking, the, especially those two shots of them just looking back and forth at each other. You know, all of her makeup gone at this point. So good, so so good. Mm-hmm. I loved it. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't get a lot of the complaints with this movie. I'm surprised there's many. I, I think it's easy to focus it on them because I think critically and audience scores across the board are very very high. Like people almost universally are liking this, um, and I'm I'm glad to see that. Mm -hmm. This is the type of movie that should win Best Picture. It should be something that audiences like on top of critics. And it happened last year with Oppenheimer, and hopefully it'll happen again this year. Yeah. Which, Uh, (laughs) I don't know if you saw the Amelia Perez clip I retweeted this morning. Yeah, what Um, the fuck was that, dude? (laughs) You gotta go, you gotta watch it today, man. (laughs) It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, that's one of like 30 moments in the movie that make, that are like that absurd. I still can't figure out what this movie is, is about, like. It, is it like? Uh, don't even tell me. It's don't a, tell me. I'm gonna watch it. A, I'm, I'm gonna, well, uh, okay. You know, I'll give you just the three word, three words, okay, or five words. Trans cartel uh, kingpin makes good. That's the plot of the movie. Sounds right on my alley. Uh, musical. <laughs> the musical. Fantastic. <laughs> Oh, with that, bad that, music, but, like someone doing a bad Lin Lin Manuel Miranda like impersonation. So just a Lin Manuel Miranda, <laughs> more or less. Pretty much. The, yeah. Uh, the uh, what do you call? It? But yeah, the that's not what I'm looking forward to. Um, but yeah, that's Nora. Uh, always, I said, I feel like I said this at the end of Red Rocket. I said at the end of um, Florida Project. Always going to be excited for whoever he's got next. He's one of the few. I think directors that is very very like there are other directors out there like we're we're going to be talking soon about like Gladiator Two. Um, there are some directors that are great, like epic, massive scale, like storytelling and like me- giving you a tale, giving like an odyssey, uh, an epic or whatever, and like um, entertainment out of that. And I think there are other directors that are very good at giving you like the underbelly, like a realish story. And mm-hmm. Baker's like probably number one in that regard. Like you're talking about like this is it feels even this is like his most fantastical, maybe even though the last one was like about like a fading porn star or whatever. This is like his most fantastical I think out of all the ones he's done and it still still feels like something that you would like read about or something that you could see would actually happen in real life. Um, and I, I think that he just does just does such a great job of keeping you close to the close to the level, you know what I mean? And never going too far overboard where you like lose your suspension of disbelief. Uh, and that was greatness. And I loved it. Loved all the actors. I was watching like um, or seeing some uh, everyone's talking about the scene where uh, Toros was sitting there. <laughs> 
like complaining like, oh, you young guys, you're always on your phone. You're always, you're always on your phone all the time. And then like the actual actor that plays uh, Toros, like he yeah. just all he did all day on set was take selfies with him and the other rest of the cast. It was just like him and like like dad selfies. You know what I mean? Like him like yeah, eh, like and with them in the background. It's, uh, it's very funny. Um, great. Yeah, uh, they, I love their their dynamic. Um, but that's Nora. Uh, the other thing we talk about is the penguin ending, uh, which you just mentioned earlier. P- uh, penguin ended on a perfect, perfect note. A uh, pay perfect note. Um, without any spoilers, uh, I think that the way that they wrapped up the story was about as uh, like you could not have done it better mm-hmm. because there was a direction that it could have gone that I think would have been bad for the general vibe that de- uh, the Reeves verse has been going in. Um, and they didn't do that. And that would have been the safe way to do it. They went with the less safe way, which I think was smart and um, it played great. And just to, as a general thoughts on the series, the acting top to bottom, I mean, we've, we've talked about it. It's like one of the best miniseries in recent memory. Kristen Milioti should be a lock. I mean, Colin Farrell should be a lock. Uh, even I think when you talk about some of the other characters in the show too, like the actress who played, I think her name is Moira or something uh, who played uh, uh, the penguin's Mother. mom. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. In those last few episodes, she like comes in, like just throwing a thousand down the middle of the fucking plate. Like she was unreal. Uh, and like the actor who played Vic, the actor who played um, some of the other guys, they were all just perfectly cast, did a great the job. Kid. Did a- the kid who played young penguin. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable. Very, very good. Uh, and our, our, our good boy, uh, Lewis cancel me. Uh, the, guy, <laughs> the guy who played, uh, was it, um, Rex Calabrese, Rex Calabrese. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, I really liked the penguin ending uh, without spoilers. Yeah, no, I, I loved it. And you said, you know, they, they went for the correct ending in the last, you know, at the end, everything tied up perfectly. I agree. But up until about that last 15 minutes, I was like, it had me, you know, on the edge of my seat, worried that they were going to go in a direction I, I would have hated, um, which yeah. was perfect because it i mean i was literally on the edge of my seat like who's going to die someone has to die please let someone die um and then without spoiling someone does the way they handle sophia the way they handle the penguin like the penguin was just handled everything else in the series is great but from just a character study standpoint everything every choice made with the penguin was so pitch perfect um if you want to talk about spoilers now um, yeah, let's talk about spoilers now. So skip forward if yes. you haven't watched the ending yet. The, the decision, I mean, the big one, obviously, him killing Vic at the very end is just unbelievably ballsy and perfect. You could have had him die two episodes before, one episode before. You could have had the Penguin kill him in so many different ways. Sophia kill him. But the decision to have Penguin get out of the whole mess, end up on top, in large part because of Vic's actions, and then mm-hmm. kill him, like perfect after he calls him family unbelievable Mm -hmm. in uh, i think that the way they constructed that scene was so perfect too because i almost thought while watching that scene i think everyone could feel the tension i almost thought that vic was going to kill him yeah i was like borderline on i'm like i don't know something is going to happen here i just i don't know what's going to happen here Uh, it's going to be one of them is going to kill the other and my in my brain i'm like he's going to take the lessons that the penguin has been giving him and kill him more or less and like Mm -hmm. take out his own weakness but uh, I've liked the way that they went with it. Uh, Kim killing Vic is it, it is almost like um, you ever like I forget if it was like Spartans or some shit like um, they would like be like soldiers would be forced to like raise a puppy and then they have to kill it before they graduate. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of yes. like that story with Vic where uh, like you you meet him as this like doe eyed, super innocent kid that you build a lot of empathy for throughout the series with like his family um, getting killed and all that shit. And like you you root for Vic. He's the actual mm-hmm. good guy, and you root for the penguin to a degree because he's the lesser of two evils and to uh, to a degree in the rest of the series, and that kind of like battles up against um, Miliati. But like they're both battling up against the the crime family, so it doesn't they they don't clash that much until later in the series. So I think that that sort of feeling of betrayal and reverting to the fact that like look, we are, it is a series about the penguin. He doesn't need to be the good guy. He does need to end mm-hmm. this as the good guy. He is a piece of shit, like criminal mastermind. He's a bad guy. He's a bad guy. But so I like that they went back and they, they brought us to that level. And that's helped set up for the Batman two, which will come out, I'm assuming in 2030 at some point, at some point, <laughs> um, yeah. but we'll get there, which is nice. And, and I think Colin Farrell did say that he does, they, there is planned. It is planned for him to be in uh, yes. Batman. The, Batman I think three. he said like five to 16. Who knows what that means? But yeah. Yeah. He, I think he very clearly has a role uh, moving yeah. forward in the Batverse, which is great. 
um, he's also just much more villainous now. Like yeah. he was scary in, in, you know, the Batman, like he's a bad guy, but he's very clearly an underling. Whereas now he's, I mean, the kingpin of, of crime families. Um, yeah. And the, another decision, the, the, the decision not to kill Sophia off would seem so cowardly and so many other, you know, series if it had been handled differently, but the way it, it's set up where it's like, oh no, you're going back to Gotham and we showed you in episode four how fucking awful Gotham is. This is worse than like or Arkham, killing yeah. you. Or yeah. yeah, Arkham. This is worse than me killing you. Um, yeah. And you can see just the the fear in her eyes. Like she's like let down that she's not being shot in the head by the penguin in that scene. Like she's like, mm -hmm. fuck me. Um, great stuff. Great. Just great stuff. Um, I'm trying to think of other things that very end with the uh, you know he's keeping his mother locked in a room yep <laughs> vegetable mom and he's having his he's paying his hooker girlfriend to uh dress up in her old dresses and put yeah, her hair up like her. her yeah crazy crazy stuff um, base motel shit yeah i mean unbelievable yeah, yeah. No, I, I really hope the next one doesn't whatever they do next i don't think i want penguin season two right off the bat maybe and I don't think I want Sophia, but I, I really do want more. I want another villain. Um, yeah. Any kind of other character in this world. Or like Clemmer brought up the uh, Gotham police. We could do that. Anything, really. Give me just sure. Matt Reeves. Make some more stuff for me. <laughs> yeah, and credit to uh, it was it Lauren LaFranc. LaFranc. I think uh, people yes. had noted, and, and to a degree, they're correct. Um, everyone was giving credit to Matt Reeves, which this is his universe. So mm -hmm. he has due credit. And I mean, at the same time, like he's the EP on the show. A lot of these decisions do go by him. But Lauren LaFranc is the person who was the showrunner in this, and she did a great job. And when you look at her filmography, like you would not think that this is someone who was capable of something. Like Her biggest credits were Chuck and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Like that's Ooh, not like... Wait, hold on. I, wanna, I kinda want to look through this now, because I kind of want to see which season of Chuck she did. <laughs> she did, let's see... Chuck versus the Tic Tac is the... 10th episode of the third season. That's the earliest episode she wrote. Does that make, I don't know what the see. I don't know how the seasons work qualitatively on season. Chuck. Season three is a good season. It's not the best season, but that's it's Chuck before versus before it got bad. I'll give her that much. She basically did the third through the fourth season from what I can tell. Yeah. How did she, now I'm looking at this. How the hell did she even get this job? <laughs> I don't know what impulse is. I've never watched that. So that maybe I'm just, it's a, let's see what channel is this on YouTube premium. Okay, so, oh, and here's an interesting thing about her that it might you might be interested in. Um, so she was the executive producer on Impulse, which is a YouTube premium series based on the Jumper book series by what Stephen Gould. LeFranc joined the series after the pilot was directed by Doug Lyman. Uh, I might be watching this today. On, uh, yeah, this on YouTube premium? What the fuck is YouTube premium? I have no fucking clue. It, it is <laughs> literally is, a Jumper... This is Gamecast. <laughs> this is... Bro, this is a, yeah, this is fucking, <laughs> she made a jumper series with, I don't know any really many of these names. Let's see. Uh, I know Keegan Michael Key, and that's basically it on this cast, more or less. Yep. Daniel uh, Maslany. Yeah. I wonder if he's really to Tatiana. Um, but, wow. Yeah, no, hats off to Lauren LaFranc. Um, I think there's a lot of elements in here where you can clearly tell it was written by a woman, but in the best way possible. Uh, yeah especially as it relates to Sophia's character, like yeah. great stuff. And you get a lot of like uh, influences from other things too. Like I mentioned, like even like the, like the killing the dog thing, I think is a borrowed motif, like a lot of Soprano stuff people mention. I still think that I completely disagree with the people that said like, um, Oh, uh, Oz and Vic are like Tony and Chris. Like again, to me, I think penguin is Chris. He is Chrissy all the way through just insecure. Want thinks he deserves more respect. Wants the power wants all that money wants all that stuff that he's Chrissy I think it might be closer to uh and maybe not even that I was gonna say Walter White and Jesse uh where Walter really uses Jesse to his own you know ends and really fucks Jesse's whole life up <laughs> but he does I don't think he, but he does like help him at the end mm -hmm. he does can't say the same about Oz yeah no he's he's a truly evil character like as evil as we've we've seen <laughs> yeah the uh uh, what do you call it? Um, I think that they're, it was a really good, great series overall. I think they do such a, such a great job. And they mentioned how they want to go character study heavy on the rest of the ones. And I, like, I, I agree with you that that would be the, the golden standard for 
anything DC moving forward. And man, how much do you think it sucks to be anybody in Marvel television right now? Just DC cannot miss in live action. And all Marvel does is just at best at like the best they get is like a, like a Loki. And then like the mean, the mean for them, right. Is like below mediocre. Like, like, like I would say like more like their, their mean is like a 60, like a 60 overall, I would say. Right. Yeah. And I mean, credit to Warner brothers. Uh, they're not forcing, you know, like mandatory cameos down their throat. Like the most we ever got was that one little shot at the very end of the bat signal in the sky. And I guess the Selena Kyle letter at the very, very, very end. Like yeah. it gives the writers and everybody so much more freedom when you're not worried about how is this going to affect the overall universe, the overall ecosystem of our, of our, you know, MCU. Like yeah. they're not worried about that. I'm sure Matt Reeves has, you know, held off on, joining james gunn's dcu for that exact reason it's like i have my own sandbox over here and i can do whatever the fuck i want like i don't have to worry about what you have going on it's better this way um exactly yeah and it's good it's good for dc on a whole i mean you're to not have like imagine if marvel could just make a split off universe for something and no one would care like and people like that because they could just do a different tone you can do a different thing not everything needs to be tied together it is it's great for both parties because it gives Mm -hmm. you general interest in your broad spectrum ips while also letting you do your own separate stuff. So that's, I think. And realistically, Marvel, their television should be like that. It should be siloed off in the the movies. Because, I mean, we're, what, five years into this Marvel movie or Marvel TV? None of the series stuff has affected the movies at all. Like, they don't really tie in at all. So, like, why are you really even adhering to the universe's, like, rules at that point? Like, do your own thing on television. Do fucking Werewolf by Night 500 times. (laughs) Do do Werewolf by Night 2. Yeah, dude, you'd be so much better off in every possible way if you just did more Werewolf, Werewolf by Night anthology, uh, anthology stuff. Uh, you mentioned the franchise before. Uh, I like the last franchise episode a decent amount. I, I think that one of the cool things about the series, and this is, we, we talked about it before. It's too insider for me to recommend this show to basically mm-hmm. anyone, which sucks. But like, if you pay attention to movie news and you are like, just, I would say, even like remotely invested in that world. There's so many things. Every single episode tackles a different like sort of uh, um, scandal that hits franchise movies all the time. And every episode tackles it individually and is very funny. Like um, this episode, this episode I thought was really good. Specifically, fucking. Actually, ha- I'm the- just now realizing I have not watched this re- most recent episode. But go ahead and talk about it because I'm just going to put the it on afterwards. The only thing I would say is that uh, Billy Magnuson is very funny. He uh, <laughs> so he, good. He just comes into a scene and he goes like. Hey, you guys ever see Borat? You know, my wife, Jeek Shumash or whatever. And like, they're like, yeah. And he goes, well, anyway, I was thinking about putting a band together to uh, put some performances on. And like, what does that have to do with Borat? It's just like, you just want to like, <laughs> talk about Borat. He's just, he's so, he's very funny in this. Richard Grant has been very funny. Uh, Def Patel, great. Like everyone's been, or not Def Patel. Oh my God. That was racist. Um, oh my God. Uh-huh. <laughs> what the fuck's his name? Oh, do you think about Himesh? Himesh Patel? Himesh Patel, yeah, Himesh Patel, sorry. Yeah. Um, he, he's been very good. Everyone's been um, uh, fantastic top to bottom. And I really like, I really like, and I don't know the actor's name, the guy that plays like the Kevin Feige. Of yes, this world. I was about he, to say that. <laughs> he's so funny, dude. <laughs> it's, it's like, oh my God, that, that FaceTime call, he basically pulled the, the, the less gross spin. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, this is, yeah. This is how we get reamed out in 2024. Like, <laughs> the China, the tractors. From yeah, the, the tractors thing. Not the most recent episode, but the episode before the, the tractors killed me. Mm, that was that was <laughs> oh, so good. They're speaking. It's like going. It's like in reverse, and it's like speaking Mandarin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're in space. How are we going to incorporate space tractors? And like, oh well, the thought process is since you incorporated one, you can do all of them uh, instead of putting it on like Centurios or whatever the other one. Yeah. Was. Oh, great. Uh, but yeah, it, it has been. Uh, a fun time, not one I, I feel safe. If you're listening or watching to this, like you would probably like it. That's what I would say. Um, but outside of that, it's tough to recommend. Uh, anything else you've been watching? Uh, no, I saw a, a different man. Pretty good. I liked it a lot. I see why people love it. Um, good, great Sebastian Stan performance, but not not the best picture contender. I think people want it to be, but very very good. It's it's almost too sad for me. I think that might be the issue. Do you? Uh, uh, people said it's Sebastian Stan's best performance. Would you agree with that? You know, I actually think his Apprentice performance was even better than this. <laughs> like he was, 
he was really good in The Apprentice. Like Definitely he makes you he makes you believe he is young Donald Trump. Uh, about thirty minutes thirty minutes into that movie, and mm-hmm. never lets up. Um, I'd have to think harder on like his other perform like other roles he's taken on, like outside of Marvel. But it was, I mean, if someone said that that was their favorite performance, I, I would absolutely have no problem mm-hmm. with that. Like, that's very fair take. Yeah. Um, trying to think of what else I've been watching. Um, Silo a lot of season stuff. two drops this week, uh, weekend, I think. Yes. Could be wrong. Right. I still haven't watched. Um, I, I think I did the first episode of Silo and I just kind of like fell off and I was like, oh, I'll get back to it. And I just haven't. And I, everyone I know that's seen it has mm-hmm. really liked it. Um, and I love Rebecca Ferguson and. It's basically good. everyone involved. And I like it sci-fi. picks up. It picks up. I will say that. Yeah. I'll get back to that. Um, what else? Oh, I rewatched Dirty Harry. Uh, nice. What we do in the shadows has been very. It's been funny. Not as funny as the previous season, but still very funny. Oh, I haven't started that yet. Damn. Um, yeah, that's been airing. Uh, and then I, I watched. And you, you had did the, did the graphics. I'm sure. So uh, I watched this Arnold movie, this old Arnold movie, Raw Deal. Which yeah. I think I watched my dad when I was a kid. But there's such a funny line. Like the character's name is like you know John P. Smith. And this guy goes like, "What's what's the P stand for?" And he goes, "Pussy." And it's just so funny. The P is for pussy. Like it's just such a fucking random out of nowhere. Is clip. That, like, are you insulting yourself, Arnold? Or is this like I don't know? Mean? You're pussy. I like, couldn't figure it out. It's like he said, "Like I'm getting pussy." He just said, I, "My uh, middle name is pussy." Like that when is, I was uh, trying to find pictures of the movie for the graphic, like the pictures, if you just go look up like Arnold Raw Deal, like are so funny. Like with his hair slicked back and like. I don't know. So it just put, looks like, you know, like what Arnold was in the eighties, like just, you know, yeah. some machismo dude trying to act like a, you know, American businessman who like, basically trying to look like Patrick Bateman. <laughs> no, I like get scared. And it, this is one of my ultimate favorite things about every like Arnold movies. His name is like, um, I forget yeah. what it is. It's, it's like Patrick Benson. And it's unexplained why he has just the thickest Austrian accent you've ever heard in your life. Like, hello, my name is Patrick B. B. Benson. I am from, uh, uh, I think he's from like New Hampshire or something. It's like, no, you're not. One. The one in Total Recall, I think, might be the fun. It's either Total Recall or Jingle All the Way has the funniest one. Jingle All the Way, he's uh, like Max something. The way, what the fuck was his name? It was something. Really, oh, Harold, Harold Howard Langston is Jingle How, All the Way. Like, there's there's no way. There's no, no way. There's just you look at that man. You hear him speak. His name is not Howard Langston. Like, oh, Arnold. So his name is Quaid. Yeah, but that's a uh, he plays two different character names yes. in that too, and both are, yes. don't make sense. Douglas Quaid and Carl Hauser. Hauser makes sense. Carl Hauser that. makes more sense, but Douglas Quaid. <laughs> uh, let's see. What are some of his Detective Jack Slater in the Last Action Hero? No. Agent Harry Tasker in True Lies? No. Uh, Howard Langston, we just mentioned. Uh, Detective Jericho Kane in End of Days, no. Adam Gibson in The Sixth Day, no. Captain Gordy Brewer in <laughs> Collateral Damage, no. You think they Dude, were like just too uh, nervous to give him like an Austrian or German name because he always plays the hero, and they're like, we give him an Austrian German name, like that's a villain, <laughs> like that's just a villain. <laughs> Sheriff Ray Owens in The Last Stand. Wait, like all none of these, none of these makes sense, sense, man. It's it's kind of fun. Captain James Hook in Vi Two: The Journey to China. I forgot he made those random Chinese movies with like Jackie Chan and shit. Um, Kung Fury Two. Check that one out. But yeah, the uh, there's, that's just a weird Arnold thing. But uh, that was a fun movie to watch. Um, a couple, I watched a couple of the random um, '60s and '70s epics yeah. uh, recently too. It is so funny how. Like if you could have some of the stuff from the seventies and graph it into like or bring it into like the modern day where like you pay extras pennies on the dollar or like you like get Moro- the Moroccan government to give you like laborers to act as extras yeah. and you can make like this big grand epic sequence that like you wouldn't be able to get with CGI. Like some of that stuff would be cool. Can't do it just for like a general human rights issues, but like it it looks cool in a movie like a, you know like Zulu or whatever. But yeah, uh, I saw you were watching. Yeah, you were watching a lot of historical war epics. <laughs> yeah, they're they're it's they they most of the time aren't fantastic. Like, just from like an action standpoint, because you know it's the guy getting shot and like there's no like he gets shot in the chest and he's like oh and like there's clear he yep. didn't get shot and he's like oh and like does like the full fall of the ground and like that shit kind of sucks. But like generally the movies don't look bad and they're kind of cool i don't know no i love old stuff i watched uh i also watched the last picture show have you ever seen that i don't think so nights ago 
Peter Bogdanovich movie. It's like Jeff Bridges when he's like 18. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Sybil Shepard is so hot. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, very good movie, though. Timothy Bottoms. How is that not a gay porn star? Yeah. The it's also Cloris Leachman. She plays a cougar. Her. She plays a cougar sleeping with a young man. <laughs> she plays a cougar in a movie in 1971. That's how old she was in some of these other movies. Uh, yes. But yeah, uh, shout out R.I.P. Course Bleaching. Um, but yeah, the uh, we'll be back next week with a new movie. I think that we will have a lot to choose from. I don't. I wouldn't want to do like a different man. I wouldn't want to do something sadder. I feel like we have something big coming. Oh, out, right? there's a lot of big stuff. I mean, this is. Yeah. We have Gladiator Two comes out in what two weeks? Yeah, that'll same, be same week as Wicked. Um, <laughs> oh, we gotta saw, do, uh, you know what we got to do? And anyway, it's going to be a terrible movie. Red one. I've been hearing so many god awful things about I this. I can't like wait. One, I hear it's like the worst movie of the year, which I'm yeah. pretty excited about. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm like legitimately pumped about it. Um, yeah, Gladiator Two, Wicked, Spellbound. Uh, I heard. I think Elric said like Wicked. It's like the funniest thing about Wicked, which is a 160 mo- minute movie. That's a part one of two. Was like, let me tell you the whole story. Is the first line of the movie, which is just no. Which not, like, <laughs> not like, it's very funny. Uh, oh, let's do God. red one. Let's do red one. Yeah. Next week. That'll be fun. Absolutely. So go watch red one. Uh, um, <laughs> hate, hate to ask that of you, anyone, but go watch red one. I know. All right. We'll, we'll see you next time. See you.